Ladies and gentlemen, this is Science Behind the Headlines and we're talking about depression and anxiety with Les Kuperwitz, Oliver Schubert and Joe Milton. And it seems that there is more coverage about depression and anxiety in particular in the media today than there was, if you go back 20 years, I mean, I can't recall much discussion of them at all. Am I right? Is there more media coverage? And why is there more media coverage? I can certainly come in on that. Okay. Um, there is a, a very thorough report, in fact, by the Department of Health and Aging, uh, which looks at mental health coverage back in 2000 and then again in 2007, comparing the amount of coverage and kind of the quality of the coverage as well. Um, and they found that there was a two and a half fold increase in coverage. So back in 2000, 2001, there were about 17,000 stories uh, around mental health. So this isn't just anxiety and depression, but it's all, all different aspects of mental health. Um, when they looked again in 2006 to 2007, that had gone up to 42,013. Wow. So a huge, and that you know, feeds into what you were saying about, um, although people may still find it very hard to admit that they're depressed, there's certainly a lot more conversation in the media uh, around depression and anxiety and mental health issues than, than there was in the past when it was really sort of swept under the, the carpet and not dealt with at all. Um, so we have seen a really big increase in those sort of five or six years uh, in the amount of reporting. And it's all, the quality has also improved a lot over time as well. There are a few sort of areas for improvement, but um, this study found that, you know, fewer and fewer stories about suicide or self-harm were mentioning the method that people had used to take their own lives, which is a big no-no in reporting suicide. You don't go into the methods because of that, that leads to people copying those methods. Um, so there was a re big reduction in that. Uh, there's a reasonably big reduction in the use of um, inappropriate language, things like calling people schizo or psycho and things like that, has also dropped. And uh, articles that were sort of judged to be uh, encouraging stigma also, also decreased. So um, there are a couple of areas um, where it hadn't really improved in terms of identifying people and labeling them as having had a mental illness, which is a kind of privacy issue, really. So that hasn't really improved. And um, the number of inaccurate headlines actually doubled. Uh, but there were fewer that were overly dramatic or sensationalist. So we are seeing that it's uh, much more interest and it's a better quality of reporting. Well, overall, that sounds like a positive report card. Is that a good thing for mental health and, uh, and seeking treatment for mental health, do you think, Oliver? Yeah, that's certainly a good thing, yeah, if, if certain standards are... are but pursued, how much of it know. is confirmational bias? You know, if you're talking about it more, more people will identify with the conditions. Yeah. Well, what, what I'll say in this context is that, that uh, Australia is in the top three internationally for prescriptions of antidepressants. I think only Iceland actually prescribes more antidepressants than, than Australia. Uh, just a, a recent OECD study out on that. Come on, we can do better. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a concerning trend. I mean, this, this might teach us two things. Firstly, we're detecting many more cases that actually benefit from antidepressants, which might be the case. But secondly, the, uh, secondly, the, 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 the other way of, of interpreting that is that, you know, they're over-prescribed over uh, over and they might be used for uh, conditions that should be probably treated otherwise mm -hmm. and, and don't really warrant them. And I certainly think that general practitioners uh, have often face the problem with people attending their practice and actually asking for a prescription, um, you know, saying this is what I have and this is what I want in terms of treatment. And in the absence of, you know, adequately funded mental health services and, and the death of sort of clinical psychologists who can offer other kind of treatments. Um, that is often what doctors do. And I think, sorry to interrupt there, I think, I think the, uh, what Oliver is highlighting is a trend where we look for help, we, we're not feeling good within ourselves. And the help we're often offered is to say, well, I've got something that can help you not feel so bad as opposed to an approach which says, well, we've got to explore your feelings and see, in the first instance, can we help you deal with these feelings? And can we help you manage um, how you're feeling? 
and then know the difference between when we have to step in uh, and when we try and um, encourage the person to take control. And you have a, a greater arsenal than simply the drugs. You've got yes. uh, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy and, and a, a, a number of other tools. We, we to have a potentially greater arsenal, but uh, it also means that then people need an increased consultation time and that um, then also brings into uh, play funding issues and... Yeah, yeah, it, it's a complex thing. Uh, Joe, when um, we see anything, uh, a, even a brief article about depression or anxiety in the media, there's almost always the, if you're feeling these symptoms, these mm. are the people to contact. There must be some guidelines around the way that we or the, the media is allowed to talk about conditions like depression and anxiety, what are they? Yeah, well, that's true, and that's somewhere where Australia is quite strong, I think. Um, there are a lot of guidelines around suicide, particularly, and that's um, where some, there are really some quite strict codes about what you do and what you don't do if you want to stop uh, other people killing themselves in sort of copycat suicides. Um, so there are more sort of firm codes around suicide than are around mental health. And often the mental health codes are considered to be um, part of the wider codes around things like discrimination uh, and uh, privacy and accuracy as well sometimes. Um, so I know at the moment that the Australian Press Council, it has a, a fairly strict set, set of guidelines uh, or codes around suicide. And they're working at the moment on uh, refining and developing their codes around uh, mental health more generally. So that's kind of the press side. The age has its own little set of guidelines as well. Um, and then there are uh, codes for all the different kind of broadcast organizations. So for, for example, for commercial radio, there's a set of codes. For free to view television, there's a set of codes. The ABC has its own set of codes. Um, and uh, they all sort of follow these kind of general principles, uh, which are fairly well accepted internationally, actually, about how you report mental health without making stigma worse. Things like not defining people by their illness. So you should never refer to somebody as a schizophrenic. You know, it should be a person who's had a diagnosis of schizophrenia or something along those lines. Um, do, those, <coughs> do, do those subtleties really mean anything? Would, would a schizophrenic appreciate not being called a schizophrenic? That's a, well, I know, I know a lot of people with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who would appreciate uh, not having that label. Okay. Um, and and again, a manic depressive would yeah. rather be defined as someone yes. with manic depression and, rather than a manic depressive. And that raises, again, one of the issues that Oliver brought up, that the, the contemporary diagnoses we have are created categories. We can't, so they're not illnesses or conditions as such. They were observed categories. So to actually diagnose somebody as having schizophrenia is medically incorrect. We, because we don't know, we still don't know biologically what schizophrenia really is. Right, yet, yet more subtleties to, to play with. Um, let's move on, we've got another clip now. Uh, this is Nathan Thompson, who was a former AFL footballer. I think uh, my biggest worry was just being a failure. Um, you know, I was playing AFL footy and uh, probably seen as you know, being a, a strong and, and happy guy, yet, you know, underneath I wasn't. I was, you know, the exact opposite, you know, and uh, I didn't want people to to know that I was struggling and I, I thought it was a weakness in me and I, I definitely didn't want anyone to think that I had a, you know, some sort of soft underbelly or there was uh, something, uh, something wrong with me, you know, because I really felt that I, you know, I was, deep down I felt that I was sick. And I, and I knew that I had a problem, but I just didn't want to admit it. Once again, we're talking expectations here are leading to or contributing to the condition. And earlier I was talking about, you know, uh, in role models like Jessica Rowe, it would be easy to sit back and say, well, she's got everything, what she got to worry about. But when it comes to those expectations, you know, our modern society places all kinds of expectations on everybody uh, that weren't necessarily there you know, uh, uh, in our fathers and, and mothers' generation. Uh, you know, these days, uh, 
uh, a woman is expected to be a wife, um, uh, have a career, uh, hold down the family, etc., uh, etc. Et the husband still has to go out and uh, uh, have a career, you know, bringing in the, the, the bread and still uh, be at home for the family. And the pressures are there, and they, uh, they're probably exacerbated in our family. So the, the role of expectation in depression and anxiety, is that uh, an increased factor in the modern era? Yes and no. Um, I think, as I said, throughout generations, pressure has always been there. There have been various different supports available. Um, I think in evolutionary terms, the nuclear family wasn't really meant to be. So I think um, that uh, now living in isolated uh, sort of little units and sometimes single units is, a, is, is not the way that our brain developed for us to live. Um, so that adds its own pressures. The, um, uh, the blurring of roles also um, does add pressures, but um, that's part of adaptation. That's part of... Um, I suppose, in a way, it comes around to... Uh, are we redefining what normal is when it comes to the expectations of, of people these days? And yeah. that there are, you know, the new normal uh, has much higher expectations placed on it than a generation ago. Would, would that be a fair observation of it? Yeah, I think that, that uh, if anybody sort of being sort of middle-aged uh, with young families or so at the moment would, would, would feel that kind of pressure. I've, I've no doubt about that. Um, and we're living in a, in a, in a very competitive society uh, where, you know, weaknesses are not tolerated generally in the workplace and by society as in, in large. And um, there's no way of that receding, I don't think. That's just something we have to deal with. Um, the difficulty, or one difficulty in, in, in terms of expectations also, I think, is the expectations we've developed as a society around our health and our mental health and the sort of place that health and health concerns have now taken in everybody's conscience. You know, some, some authors was, would go as far that that has to a degree actually replaced religion and that, that health and health concerns and wellness concerns and all that actually have become a religion. Um, and to conform to those ideals, just as hard as it is to conform to religious ideals, uh, certainly adds to the pressure as well. Well, that, I mean, that's again, that's, that's very interesting in terms of um, the media that we get so many stories now about how unhealthy we are, yet we live far longer and far safer lives than we ever did. But we're always being told how uh, poorly we're living. Yeah, God bless Hungry Jacks. Um, <laughs> look, uh, I'd like to wrap this up so that we can get some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, But it would be remiss of us now, uh, without us actually producing our own list, of what should people be on the lookout for and what should they do if they think that they are depressed or anxious? What's, your, what's the, the take-home message well, what, what, what I would say, if you observe in yourself or in somebody that is close to you that they stop functioning in the way that they have in some way, that they drop off their you know, achievements at work, if they drop off their functioning within the family, and if they seem to turn into themselves for some reason, that's usually a fairly solid sign that something is going on and that, that, that help might be required. They're pretty amorphous things though, aren't they? I it's think that, I think that uh, the, the hallmark, that loss of interest in what... Uh, we usually have something that drives us in life, that gives us an interest or a passion. And one of the cardinal signs is seeing somebody losing interest in something that they were passionate about before. And yes, it's, it's, it's uh, quite general, but that's a warning sign to say, well, go for, well, let's explore that. Go for, see somebody who, with whom you can explore that, and let's look at the reasons why that's happening. 
Okay, and uh, do we actually have a, a list for the sorts of organisations to contact? Well, at, at the end, we will be putting up a, a list of organisations uh, that people can contact. Uh, and it's worth uh, having those on hand because it may not necessarily be you that, uh, that needs to contact uh, such organisations. It may be a loved one or a friend. Uh, let's turn to some questions from the audience. Do, if, if we have any questions from the floor, up the back here. Yeah, I'm interested in the panel's view on lifestyle and depression and its management. Uh, areas such as humour, uh, exercise, diet, vitamins, fasting perhaps, which um, I've read recently in uh, Michael Mosley's book, um, looks at um, restricting diet for a period of time, taking a couple of days a week, um, where you don't eat at all or minimise your calorie intake can be beneficial. And in the treatment of um, depression itself, what, what sort of hormone medication do you recommend as the, the key element, such as serotonin, perhaps? OK, so uh, having self-diagnosed, are there things that people can actually do for themselves to uh, improve their situation? Well, there's certainly a concept of a stepped approach in, 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 in mental health towards treating conditions like depression. And the first step uh, on, on, on that approach is always looking at lifestyle issues. So cutting down on alcohol, for example, eating healthier, whatever that might mean, um, you know, making sure one gets enough exercise and sleep. And actually, a quite, quite a significant proportion of problems will self-limit and, and, and resolve just based on those measures. Um, so any general practitioner will probably uh, recommend those kind of issues. It's when difficulties don't resolve um, and, and the kind of symptoms get worse and so on that uh, medication will be one of the things that might be discussed alongside or alternate to some form of psychotherapy. And the mainstay medications that we use are called uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is a medication that seems to act on that particular neurotransmitter in the brain, but probably has a lot of other um, activity in the brain and with nerve cells as well that might be just as important. Is it true that, uh, as with other conditions, that early intervention is the best thing? Uh, that, that, that the longer you leave it, the worse the situation will be? Yeah, that, there's certainly no doubt about that. So, uh, similar to a, you know, cancer, uh, the earlier to ca you, you catch the issue, the, the, the better the outcome is, is likely to be. Yeah, we don't want somebody's brain to get used to being depressed, mm -hmm. and that's become their way of life. Okay. So, uh, that earlier, and, and then um, the healthy lifestyle interventions, uh, as long as the person has uh, enough motivation and enough structure and enough support to be able to be involved in those so that we don't make them feel even worse because they can't do that. Um, we have another question just before we go there uh, with respect to uh, the whole question of, of, of the treatment of depression and anxiety. What happens if it's not treated? I mean, not everyone's going to suicide. Uh, do people just get over it? Yes, uh, talking about depressive episodes, they are generally a self-limiting condition, uh, but you're talking about many months, usually around a year of being consistently depressed before it's likely to, to lift, but it will lift. So what we do in treatment is, is lessen the consequences of that and, and, and shorten significantly the time that people are suffering from it. Um, it's a bit more like a comment. Um, when I heard about Charlotte, Dawson, I thought, switch off your computer. I was bullied relentlessly at work and I had to keep going back and going back and going back until I was so depressed I didn't want to get out of bed for three days. Um, I might be showing my age, but if you have had one bad comment on Twitter, turn your computer off. Uh, even more generally, if you are in a situation and you realise that there's 
some force that's uh, causing you to become depressed, causing you to become anxious? Is simple avoidance of that cause? If it's, if it's possible, it's not. Uh, again, I think we understanding the complexity. So somebody, for instance, who gets caught in an abusive relationship or an abusive workplace, um, sometimes there's a history behind that. There's a history of what happened to them very early on in their lives. Um, it's the type of patterns that their brain will develop in terms of um, how, what their coping mechanisms. So we, whereas we can look at it from the outside and say, oh, it's quite simple, just get out of the situation. When somebody's in that cycle and feels trapped, it's not so easy. And I think, um, as well, it's quite easy to sort of say, just turn off your computer. And I have thought my, that myself about people dealing with Twitter trolls. But uh, you have to remember that for uh, teenagers, then not being on Facebook, not being on these things, is quite an isolating for, thing for them in, in it itself. It could be a source of anxiety in yeah, itself. Yeah, because yeah. they've grown up with that. You know, it's something that we've come, come to and we can take or leave. But for them, maybe it's much more what they feel is an essential part of life and they're willing to put up with the bad for the good but you know still psychologically very difficult for them to deal with that kind of bullying that doesn't stop uh, a question about um ssris the um one of the common treatments for for depression in your experience as clinicians, uh, is there an increase in tolerance to these drugs over a period of time, like you know, five, ten years, that sort of that sort of time period? And um, do do these sorts of um, drugs require, I guess, an increase in dosage over time? Um, they're very very much so in, in many respects that um, they might require an increase or a decrease in dosage over time depending on the intensity and severity of the symptoms at any time. Uh, we're dealing with wh why we um, are reluctant to rush in to prescribe those medications uh, for, straight away is we're dealing with medications that change um, not only the chemical balance in the brain but actually the structure of nerve cells in many ways, the way that they're communicating with each other. So after a while, very similar to somebody who, say, becomes reliant on medication to control their blood pressure, um, people might become reliant on medication to control um, the way their brain's communicating or interacting, uh, and they may need uh, changes in dosage, and, and that's wh why the, the idea of just prescribing something and saying, okay, come back once a year, um, they, they still need uh, a close eye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes uh, Science Behind the Headlines and our look at depression and anxiety. Could you please get a, uh, your hands together for my esteemed panel tonight, Les Kubwitz, Oliver Schubert and Joe Milton. <laughs>